Let's continue our study of arrays of primitive data by looking at allocation and access issues. Here are the critical properties of arrays. All of the elements in an array must be of the same type. Now, this could be a primitive data type, something like int or double with a little d, or it could be references to a type of object, for example, references to strings. Array elements have to be placed into contiguous memory in the computer. This is a very important limitation and is the cause of a lot of the challenges we have working with arrays. What's more, the number of elements must be known in advance and can't be changed. The reason this is true is because the array elements have to be placed into contiguous memory. So for example, suppose we had put elements in locations 100 to 105 and then we needed to increase the size. There's no way for us to know that locations 106, 107, 108 haven't been used for something else, so there's no way that we can make it bigger. This is a real limitation. Now, there is a way to work around it, and that's you can construct a new array and then copy everything over. But remember, that's going to be expensive. While a lot of the arrays that we've looked at in these examples are small, often three to five elements, mostly so that I can draw them for you easily. Arrays in the real world tend to be millions or even billions of elements. Reallocating memory and copying things over gets to be very expensive. So let's take a look at the mechanics of array allocation. Arrays are stored like objects. Now what I mean by that is you create a reference and then you allocate them on the heap using a constructor. Remember, constructors always use the word new. So for example, int square bracket data equals new int square bracket 5. This is what this looks like in memory. Data is a reference, and then we allocate five places on the heap. Now these five places are going to hold integers. The arrow between data and the five places on the heap indicates that the reference for data points to that location in memory. In other words, the first address is what's sitting in data. As far as indexing arrays goes, well, arrays are zero indexed. Now this should be expected because you've seen this in array lists and strings. Because array lists and strings contain arrays, their indexing is the same as arrays. This is actually kind of helpful because at least everything works the same way. The reference contains the address of the first element. To get the address of other elements, what you do is you add the address in the index. Let's take a look at how this works. So here we have data. Now the 372 that I'm showing in the data box is the reference to the first element of the array. The number itself doesn't have any significance, it's just an array address. And notice, because they're in contiguous memory locations, the second is at 373, the third is at 374, the fourth is at 375, and so on. So the way that you get to the location in memory is you take 272, the address of the first element, and that you add the index. So for example, the address 374 comes from adding 2 to 372. This is actually why we zero index things, is so that this little equation works. What it does is it makes it possible to jump to any place in the array with just one addition operation. That property is called random access, and it's critically important for programming. Now, arrays do have a data field that gives the number of elements that have been allocated. So if we do int square bracket data equals new int square bracket 5, same as we've been doing all along, data.length is going to be 5. Now, first off, notice this is unit indexed, not zero indexed. What's more, there are no parentheses. Now, the reason there are no parentheses here is because length isn't a method. It's data that's stored in the array. This is kind of a weird operation, and don't get worried about making mistakes like this on tests. I won't take off points for it because it's such a minor error, but it is kind of an important point. The other thing to remember is there is no data square brackets of 5. Now that seems really odd, but remember, the 5 in this data of square brackets, that is the index. Well, indices are zero indexed, whereas length is unit indexed. This stuff drives you crazy at first, but you do get used to it after a very short period of time. Now, Java does check to make sure that you're not going over the end of the array. 
This is a very nice thing for beginning programmers because one of the hardest mistakes to find is stepping over the end of the array. If you do happen to do this accidentally, you'll see an array index out of bounds exception. Let's look at some typical loop operations. If we have our same array that we've been allocating all along, for int index equals zero, index less than data dot length plus plus index. Remember, data dot length is the number of elements in the array. Because it's unit indexed, we want to use less than, not less than or equal to. And then we can do whatever we want in the array. In this case, I've just done a system out print line for a data element. So that's a very typical for loop and is really the most flexible and useful one. So the pattern you're seeing here is you start with zero and you end with less than in the data dot length. That pattern holds because of the differences between unit indexing and zero indexing. Here's another option though. Now this one has sort of a strange name. It's called a for each loop. So you do for int i colon data. So data is the name of the array, or to be more precise, the reference to the array. And we have int i because it's an array of integers. Now when you do system out print line, you can just use i instead of indices. So this isn't stepping through indices. It's actually stepping through the elements of the array. Now why this is called a for each loop is mostly due to historical reasons. When this was first proposed to be part of Java, people wanted it called for each to have a different name. But the people who implement Java decided it would be easier to do this with just the for. Unfortunately, the name stuck. So you'll just have to remember that subtle difference. Now there is a limitation to for each loops, and that is you're only allowed to access the elements. You're not allowed to change them. So for example, we can't do add or remove to the array inside the loop. So let's talk a little bit about how arrays and array lists are different. Now array list objects do contain a hidden array. You can sort of guess that from the name. Primitive data types, however, aren't allowed. Now this is hard to see because Java does a little trick with wrapper classes. So instead of putting an array of ints, it creates an array of integer. Integer is the wrapper class that matches the primitive data type int. This is concealed from you by a trick that's called autoboxing. It's a little beyond the scope of the class, so we're not going to worry about it too much. If you want to look into it, a search on autoboxing will give you lots of details. Array list objects resize the array when you run out of space. Now you'll remember that I said that arrays couldn't be resized, that is without reconstruction. So what the array list is really doing is reconstructing the array and copying things over. Now these details are concealed from a naive programmer and this can be a hidden expense. In fact, when my former students call me up and ask me for help on a program, this particular problem is one that shows up a lot. So be aware of the fact that the array list has this hidden expense so it doesn't surprise you someday. Keep programming.